What an honor to be here this afternoon, uh, to be back at TEDS, and uh, was walking around campus yesterday and today, and uh, brought so many memories of my uh, days at, at Trinity as a student. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Tino for uh, extending a cordial invitation to uh, speak at the, at the uh, Paul Heaver Center for Global uh, Christianity and Global Theology, and also to Mrs. Uh, Armida uh, Belmonte Stevens uh, for helping me in many ways for this conference. Paul Heaver uh, is one of my heroes. Uh, I learned to love him, to appreciate him. He was not only my professor, but he was also my mentor and somebody who played a very important role in my life, in my academic journey, and in many ways uh, became my spiritual father. I remember when I heard the news that of his passing. I was in New York. I, there was a big storm in New York, and I was not able to, to travel to his funeral, which happened to be in, in near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, I cry, like uh, I lost somebody dear to me, like, like my father, you know. And uh, so I really high, I hold him very high, in high honor, uh, and I continue to share his teaching and his insights to my students at Lee University. Summer 2004, my wife Ruth and I traveled to India to do an on-site visit to our summer interns. We required 10 weeks, 10 week internship for our students at the end of their junior year. They have to spend 10 weeks somewhere around the world where we have partnership. And it happened that our students were doing internship in India and uh, Ruth and I traveled there and uh, we stayed at the Mennonite College in, uh, in Sham Shabbat, in the Andhra Pradesh uh, state. And uh, one morning, we're having breakfast, uh, and uh, the lady, uh, a local lady, told us the story that uh, we were staying in the same room that uh, Paul Heber was born. <laughs> I was so excited that uh, Ruth and I were staying in the room that Paul Heber, years ago, he was born. I didn't know that, that part of the story. So upon my uh, return to the US, I called Dr. Heber, and I told him, you know, that Ruth and I would stay in the same room that he, he was born. He was so excited, and he told me, I'm glad you were able to go to India. He says, people in India need to hear the voice of a Latino. He was always a very strong supporter of all of us because he believed that all of us have something to offer. And obviously, he developed his meta-theology where under the authority of God's word and the leading of the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters around the world can do theology and, and uh, build relationship with one another. In May 2015, my wife, Ruth and I had the opportunity to travel to Israel this time with 20 of our students. We visit Caesarea Philippi, where it's traditional belief that Jesus asked one of his early Christological questions recorded in the gospel. In Matthew 16 and Mark 8, who do you, the people say that I am? The disciples replied to Jesus that some people thought that he was John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah, some other prophet. But Jesus asked his disciples the crucial question, which demand that they, they must speak for themselves. Instead of merely reporting what others are saying about Jesus, Jesus asked him, who do you say that I am? Peter replied for them, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. 
The central challenge post, post to the readers of the gospel concerns about the identity and the relevance of Jesus Christ. Latin American theologians have attempted to explain the identity and significance of Jesus Christ using a variety of portraits of Christ. Both evangelicals and Catholic theologians develop what is called contextual theology, a dialogue with these scriptures and their cultures, with the hope that Latin American people will experience justice, peace, and liberation in their complex and painful context in which they live simultaneously, remaining faithful to God's word. This paper offers an invitation to the North American church and to the Latino Protestant church in the United States to rediscover the person and the impact of the message of Jesus Christ about the kingdom of God, to break down the walls of hostility and bring reconciliation with God and with one another. This Christological reflection comes from a Latino, a Latino in diaspora, born and raised in Peru, but presently living in the United States. In his book, In his book, La Santa Biblia, reading the Bible through Hispanic eyes, Cuban-American scholar Justo Gonzalez identifies five common experiences that influence how Latino read the Bible. Marginality, poverty, mestizaje, being a mixed race, a mestizo, people in exile, people in solidarity. According to Gonzalez, this section drew more attention than any other part chapter of his book. He says, this did not surprise me. For scripture is the life love of the Latino church. Each of these experiences allows Latinos and Latinas to grasp the teachings of the Bible in a way that might not be obvious to those who have not had similar experiences. So th th these particular perspectives, as well as my ministerial experience and academic journey, have influenced me in discovering the significance of several images of Jesus Christ that have impacted the Latino diaspora in this country. Let me just paint a quickly panorama context of Latino America. Latin America is, is a land of contrast with the highest disparity between rich and poor. Social inequality, racism, violence, impunity, corruption, malnutrition, lack of water, food, and, and uh, poor living conditions are among the major problems of people in Latin America. These crucial realities can be traced back to the conquest of Latin America by Spain and Portugal. In the 16th century, this domination lasted almost 500 years, and although Latin American countries gained their independence in the early 19th century, their freedom was short-lived as the continent grew heavily dependent on Europe and in the United States. Despite signs of improvement, the continent ex still experienced high unemployment, malnutrition, inadequate housing, and family disintegration. As a result, many people leave their homelands voluntarily, while others are forced to immigrate to the United States. It is no surprise, then, that the presence of Latino and Latinas immigrants in the United States has grown dramatically. Latin American Christology emerged in this context. The context of poverty and oppression and, and uh, living in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a context of suffering and exploitation. And the images that they were brought to, to, to Latin America from the West failed to do justice to the teaching of the New Testament about Jesus Christ. After eight centuries of living under the, the oppression of the 
Ottoman Empire, the Spaniards moved from being oppressed to being oppressors. The Spaniards went to the Americans, thirst for glory, gold, and the desire to impose their religion, which subsequently led to the arrival of the, of the image of the Spanish Messiah to Latino America. This kind of Christology resulted in distorted images of Jesus Christ. Young Amakey, missionary theologian from Scotland, he was serving as missionary in Peru. He captured the distortion of Christ's image with the following reflection. After visiting 13 countries in Latin America and wrote his important book, The Other Spanish Christ, Young Amakey was concerned about the lack of humanity of Jesus Christ. He argues that the Spaniards left the Christ of the gospel in Spain. And they brought their version, their Spanish version of Christ to the Americas. Two images were popular in Latin America. The suffering Christ and El Niño Jesus or infant Jesus. In his mother's arms... McKay goes on to say that this is a picture of a Christ who was born and who was and died, was born and died, but never lived. So the image of the suffering Christ places him eternally on the cross. This Christ has died as the victim of tragedy. And the image of this Christ was used by the Spaniards to encourage Incas and Mayas and Aztecs to seek out happiness and suffering. Then the Niño Jesús, or El Niño Dios, as many Latin Americans call him, is inoffensive and sweet. This baby is protected under his mother's arms. So how can he take human request? This belief explains why Roman Catholics in Latin America pray to Mary since she is able to hear and meet people's request. It is clear that the purpose of these diverse and complex images of Christ brought by the Spaniards were more appropriate for them than for the Latin Americans. By the 1830s, Protestant missionaries went to Latin America, mainly from the United States. They found the, the kind of Christology brought by the Spaniards was represented, or represented by distorted images of Jesus. This is one of the reasons why Christology became a central theme of their theological missionary enterprise. Protestant presence in Latin America was, was positive. They were doing evangelism and church planting and creating Bible schools. Nevertheless, Protestant missionaries also brought their own image of Jesus. They centered their evangelistic preaching on Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Their attention was on the image of the glorified Christ who conquered that and is alive after dying for the sins of humanity. The image of a glorified Christ promised a better life in heaven. But at the same time, it's an image that is both remote and indifferent to the social realities of Latin America. Let me share with you a few images from the Catholic Latin American Liberation and the Latin American Theological Fellowship, the FTL. People often confuse this to theologists. Daniel Salinas, PhD from Trinity in Church History, he, he, he published his dissertation and he says, and I quote him, the literature fails to point that simultaneously with liberation theologists, there was an evangelical Christian group of Latino American theologians 
that was also producing theology from Latin America. Obviously, when we talk about Latin American theology, immediately the name of Justo, Justo, Gustavo Gutierrez, I'm sorry, Gustavo, comes to you, right? Okay, he wrote this a seminal book, Theology of Liberation, where he argues that salvation cannot be limited to the spiritual realm. This new way of doing theology is the biblical way, according to Gutierrez, in which liberation requires the active participation of the oppressed. Gutierrez brings to the light what he calls God's preferential option of the poor and God's being in solidarity with the poor. These concepts are not new because Jesus called us to stand in solidarity with the poor, with the least of this. Latin American liberation theologians recognize that Jesus' proclamation that the kingdom of God is among people represents only one side of the coin of liberation. The other side is the denunciation of all that divides God from humankind and neighbor from neighbor. Liberation theologians discover that every time Jesus announced God's kingdom in the New Testament, it was accompanied by Jesus' denunciation against any group that misused power, challenging the Pharisee for discarding justice, calling out lawyers for imposing unbearable burdens, rebuking the learned from stealing the keys to knowledge castigating the priest for transforming, transforming the temple precinct into robber's den and denouncing the rulers of this world for ruling despotically. Let me talk to you a little bit about the Latin American uh, the, the, Theological Fellowship, which I'm a member. I lead one chapter in, in my town in Cleveland, Tennessee. For the last 40 years, the FTL, the Latin American Theological Fellowship, has been doing theology, contextual Christology, that encourages continuous theological reflection and discussion with the biblical text alongside the context of oppression, justice, and violence in Latin America. Latin American thinkers like Samuel Escobar, Pedro Arana, and René Padilla were very influential in forming the FTL and in the development of the contextual Christology that responds to the suffering of the poor and exploitation of the people in Latin America. Their goal was to promote an hermeneutical based on the dialogue between the biblical texts and the readers who take their context of poverty and social injustice very seriously. Ruth Padilla, René Padilla's daughter, contends that founders of the FTL demonstrated concern for the lack of an indigenous reflection. With a strong criticism, this is key, with a strong criticism or Marxism in light of a scripture and the Latin American reality. This important movement continues to create spaces for theological reflection, to strengthen the church and her mission in Latin America with the reality of God's kingdom and God's justice in mind. Important theologians, Latin American theologians, join in this effort, like Jose Miguel Bonino from Argentina, Orlando Costa from Puerto Rico, and Justo Gonzalez, I mentioned, from Cuba. René Padilla shows his concern after taking a close look to the classical Christological formulas embodying the Nicene and the Chalcedonian creeds, Padilla's observation on these creeds affirmed that Christ is fully God and fully human and as in this visible one. But they ignore Jesus' concrete actions recorded in the Gospels. Padilla believed that the metaphysical language of the creeds overshadowed Jesus' life and humanity, as well as his identification and the concern for the poor and the marginalized of his time. The creeds tend to make the doctrine of Christ 
susceptible to historical indifference. Padilla explained, and I quote, if the Christ of faith is the Jesus of history, then it is possible to speak of social ethics for Christian disciples who seek to fashion their lives on God's purpose of love and justice concretely reveal. How FTL have been playing a very important role to influence thinkers in the United States and some parts around the world. It's an important movement. Very seldom spoke in our classes, very seldom spoke in our books. I'm glad Dr. Uh, Craig Ott, who teaches here, edit a book where Rene, I mean, uh, Ruth Padilla wrote extensively about this, right? The contribution of the FTL on the Lausanne Congress on Evangelization in 1974, organized by the late Dr. Billy Graham, was evident in the development of the Lausanne Covenant, which emphasized that evangelism cannot be done without participating in social justice issues. According to Ruth Padilla, the FTL commitment to holistic mission or mission integral found its way into the United States, making an impact among prominent Latino and Latina readers in the United States, as well as gaining support from U.S. Con uh, US uh, Christians like Ron Sider and Tom Sine and Jim Wallace. I mentioned a few minutes ago, Orlando Costa, Orlando Costa from Puerto Rico. He was influenced by the FTL. He taught in Costa Rica. He was pastoring in the northeast of the United States. And based on the Gospel of Mark, Costa explored a model of, angel, of, of evangelization rooted in the ministry of Jesus that could be called a model of contextualization from the periphery. Costas placed a special emphasis on the significance of Jesus' choice of Galilee, a racial and cross-cultural roads, as the Galilean and of Galilee as an evangelistic landmark and the starting point of, of the mission of the nation with its universal implication. I ask my students every semester, why Jesus Christ has spent most of his life in Galilee? Why he didn't spend most, more time in Jerusalem? He died in Jerusalem, but most of his time, 75% of his life and ministry, he is spent in Galilee, in the north side. He was born in the south. Why is that? Well, Historians and specialists describe Galilee with so many sick people live. Women who were considered class, second class citizens then and still today even in our country. Many foreign people live in Galilee. And Jesus liked to mingle with that kind of people. And I ask my students why we don't follow the example of Jesus Christ. Why is that we are always looking for a very comfort place to do our ministry? I mean, I was sharing my story to a group of students this morning. I think when I was finishing my MDA for a very well-known seminary. I mean, we thought those who are graduates from McCormick are, 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 uh, are, are better than the graduates from Princeton. You know, in fact, there were T-shirts and McCormick says it's better, it's better to, to uh, fail at McCormick than be a graduate from Princeton. <laughs> I know some of my Princeton colleagues will not, will not like that, right? But God put me in, a, in a 18th Street and Racine to be a pastor. We're shooting every, every day, any time of the day. So Costa is, uh, is encouraging us to do, to do Christology from the periphery of our societies. And I cannot, I, I, I cannot leave one woman at least who really was, is, uh, and she lives not too far from here. Nancy Bedford from Argentina. Bedford presents her Latin American feminist Christology 
as she points that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ in whom the triune God acts as God with us and for us for the sake of justice and righteousness and transformation. Her concern is that Christology must be understood in Trinitarian terms to avoid what she calls toxic Christologies, which references discourses about Jesus that function as tools for maintaining the status quo and the domination of the other, especially women. Obviously, this is the the Catholic liberation. I mean, this is the, the Christ of Latin America. I'm sorry, trying to do those two things at the same time, you know, it's very hard, right? Okay. Well, this is the what the FTL trying to talk about Jesus Christ from the gospel, building a contextual Christology, a Christ who really identifies with his people. One of the highlights of the, of the FTL is that promote the lordship of Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ is the Lord of all areas of human life. This is a big difference that many of us sometimes in the churches that we grew up in some of our denominations just place one area, our spiritual life. And we completely forget the other areas that Jesus must take lordship and control. He should reign for all those areas. And the Latino immigrants, as you know, represents 18% of, the, U, of the, the total U.S. population. Brings challenges and opportunities. 18% of the Hispanic are, 18% um, of the total U.S. population making the largest ethnic group to surpass the African Americans. This explosive growth of the Latino population includes 11.2 million undocumented immigrants living in the United States. So in reading the Gospels, and better yet, in rereading the Gospels through the lenses of a Latino in diaspora, I have re re rediscovered the humanity of Jesus Christ describing the gospel as the foundation of my Christology. This approach emphasized the humanity of Jesus that identifies him very early in his life a part of an ethnic minority in Galilee and from the, from the periphery of his society. So bringing this Jesus Christ who did most of his ministry in Galilee from the periphery of his society. There are two important images that emerge for us, for Latino, Latinas in the United States. And one of them is the Jesus, the immigrant. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is preaching his fifth sermon. Actually, he preaches five sermons, if you know, in Matthew. And his fifth sermon it's about the Olivet Discourse, about the end of the age where he describes the ways in which one may encounter him. And he lists the thirsty, the hungry, the stranger, the naked, the sick, and the one in prison. And Jesus recognized our humanity as part of him by asserting that, that those who are providing for others in need are also providing for him. When he said... Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Jesus gave us the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 4, Luke 24, John 20. But also Jesus gave us the Great Commandment. And this is sometimes that's the last commandment that we speak. Where Jesus extends hospitality to a stranger, since Jesus himself identifies as a stranger. He used the word senos. That's what the, the word, you know, xenophobia, you know, is so popular today, right? This hostility against foreigner, stranger. And Jesus said, I'm not a foreigner. And you did not welcome me. 
Jean Pierre Ruiz has some powerful words of wisdom based on the action of, the, of Jesus the immigrant when he says, when we use the Bibles in ways that focus on the immigrant as the object of our attention, however noble our attention and however our target on summons to justice might be, we are implicated in the systematic ordering that perpetuates the very injustice we seek to correct. Ruiz will contend that although it is imperative to help the foreigner, we must avoid referring to them as others. By using this reference, we fail prey to perpetuating their circumstances, eventually deviating from our mission, which includes both the proclamation of Jesus Christ in war and in deed. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we must practice, practice hospitality, xenophilia, not xenophobia, with a deep sense of responsibility to care and welcome Latino or Latina immigrants who live in the periphery of, of our cities of North America as we place ourselves in their shoes. Paul Heber reminds us that mission is not so much what we teach. Is what we model. The Im image of Jesus, the immigrant, is relevant today as he walks alongside the immigrants because he called himself foreigners in Matthew 25. We desperately need uh, to develop a Christology where Jesus, the immigrant, is present about immigrants, advocating and, and caring for them. Jesus, the immigrant, understand the existential situation of the people on the move because Jesus is with, is with the immigrants who leave their families and their homes. U.S.-born Latinos eagerly wait for the time. Not only Latino immigrants, but U.S. Latinos born in the United States. I have three boys and I have four grandchildren and my daughter-in-law. Three of them were born in this country. They are eagerly wait for the time when they will be treated as insiders because they were born in this land. Jesus the immigrant shared his vision of the kingdom of God where he is the king while the church becomes a living example of the war of a community of reconciliation and peace. Not only to God but also with one another. And then there's another image about the image of the great, of Jesus Christ, the intercessor. Jesus praying for unity and his father before he returned to heaven. Father, he says, I want for them to be one as you and I are one. How can I bring all this to our context now. Who is Jesus Christ and why is so important for people in Latin America and from those Latino Protestants uh, who live and work in the United States? In this paper, I have explored the various images of Jesus and his significance for the Church of Latin America and the Church in the United States. It is my hope that this paper will stimulate our brothers and sisters, especially in the United States, to think further on the significance of the identity of Jesus and the powerful impact and relevance of Jesus' message for God's mission in the 21st century. By 2050, 2050, whites will cease to be majority in the United States. Latinos and Latinas live and participate in this ever-changing landscape of, Latino, of American culture and constantly influenced by it. They are responsible for shaping American values, food, and music. Their presence and contribution of Latinos and Latinas economically, socially, politically, and spiritually within the United States can no longer be ignored. So what can we learn from René Padilla and Samuel Escobar? Well, they ask us to say, involving in Misión Integral, in a holistic ministry, 
What can we learn from Justo Gonzalez? Well, read the Bible through Hispanic eyes with those five different perspectives. Orlando Costas invite us to engage in God's mission from the periphery to other peripheries in the United States and around the world. And Pentecostal Puerto Rican Eldin Villafane urge us to seek the peace of the city in the United States. The flow of, un, of documented and undocumented immigrants from Latin America plays an important role in the economy of this country. In light of the baby boomer that probably will retire very soon. Latinos will, 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 will really uh, be necessary and other ethnic people will be necessary to replace them in this country. 22% of Latinos identify themselves as Protestant. But sadly, many U.S. Protestant churches are not accepting the Latinos and Latinas into their communities of faith. So Latino Protestants find themselves not only in the margins of the church in the United States, but in the margins of their society. And many of them blaming the Latinos because they are taking their jobs away from them. And this is not new. It's happening also in Europe. Mar Mario Vargas Llosa, uh, uh, the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1997, he lives in Spain and he's familiar with the Europe context. And he's reporting also the criticism that Europeans are doing to immigrants that come from Latin America and other parts of the world. And he says, immigrants do not take, do not take jobs from locals. On the contrary, they create them and bring progress rather than deterioration. Immigration is a shot for life, energy, and culture. We should be considered a blessing by receiving countries. And Daniel Rodriguez, who teaches a Pepperdine in California, he takes this rejection story, this rejection image of Jesus Christ, and he compares of the rejection of the Latino in the United States. And then he says that that's a Jesus Christ was rejected by his people, and he became the cornerstone of the building. The Latinos and Latinas rejected in this country have become a very important in the revitalization of the life of the church in North America. I think I challenge that, unfortunately, many of our theology are not influenced by the Bible in North America. The Lifeway research says that we have more, we, the media influence more uh, on what the Bible says and what we do theology in our country. Sixty-eight percent of evangelicals said that their ch local church has never encouraged to engage in evangelism and social outreach to immigrants. This is very sad. I think the Church of North America and the Church of Latino must play an important pastoral role. These people are immigrating, coming from Latin America, away from their families. They need somebody who can listen to their stories. They need somebody who can, who can identify with them. Paul Heber constantly reminds us, past missionaries understood the scripture well, but not the people they serve. And sometimes, you know, we, we are very good in doing exegesis of the Bible, and we're very good expositors of Scripture. But we are not very good in knowing the realities of the people that we work and we're supposed to serve. We cannot forget that the church in North America should play a prophetic role, a, pro, a, a role of advocacy for the values of God's kingdom to improve the quality of life of the immigrants. Martin Luther King Jr. says that if the church does not recapture its prophetic seal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. So the Latino church 
and the North American church have an important role to play during these difficult times in where we live. Let me close with a personal illustration. I serve as a pastor in Chicago for 20 long, fruitful, and wonderful years. I did not want to leave that church that I love so much. I was invited. I was recruited by Lee University. It took months to make the decision. I talked to Dr. Heber about my decision. I talked to so many people here at Wheaton College where I have friends over there too. And I remember Dr. Heber encouraged me to go. And said, Rolando, every week I told him well, we have you know, about 300 people in our congregation on Sunday morning. And he said, Rolando, you are influencing 300 people every week. But if you go to, to Lee, you will be influencing young people, men and women who are going to be traveling around the world and influence so many people. Your scope of influence will be greater. I encourage you to take that challenge. And I did. What I have learned living and ministering among the immigrant community had a prof profound effect upon my Christology. I have witnessed my parishioners live in overcrowded apartments due to lack of adequate housing, who were cold in the winter and hot in the summer. And many of them, they were deported. I didn't know, and nobody trained me to be a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer by, by no means, but I have to be in the courts and intercede for these people before they can be deported to their countries of origin. My Christology and ministry have been influenced by this cruel reality. On several occasions, I found myself at a loss on how to pray for my parishioners. When their prayer requests were for safe passing for family members who will be crossing the United States and Mexican border that evening. Maybe my prayer was, Lord, blind those, those uh, your immigration officers, right? No, that was not my prayer. I could not pray like that. I didn't know how to pray. But you know, even though I didn't know how to pray, some of those same people who request those prayers, they brought their relatives the next service. I said, Pastor, God has heard our prayers. My brother is here. My mom is here. During this time, I learned to trust on the Christ who identified himself as a stranger. Jesus the immigrant and Jesus the great intercessor. So it is my conviction that the only hope for a better life for the families who are forced to live below the poverty line and with inadequate health services and housing and little or no education opportunities is found in Jesus Christ and in his church. The suffering Christ speaks about God's grace for the forgiveness of humanity. And the reason Christ tells us about God's victory of the power of darkness as the basis to challenge every dehumanizing power. Therefore, the church must respond to God's call to bring transformation to the world by proclaiming the gospel of salvation in Christ and committing ourselves in the struggle for freedom and justice and hope that the immigrants of Latin America and U.S. born Latinos and Latinas can be treated as insiders, not as a foreigners in their homeland. The risen Christ appears to his disciples who were afraid. They locked the doors. They found helpless. And Jesus Christ appeared to them, the risen Christ, and said, Peace unto you. Peace be unto you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. 
we no longer need to hide. We can open our doors now, wide open, I proclaim Jesus Christ and to teach what he taught us, to forgive those who do wrong to us, to seek justice and reconciliation until the kingdom of God comes. Thank you so much for your attention. Oh, yeah. you, you're not finished, you're not finished. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, uh, engaging us this way. Uh, you will see that there is a microphone there. Uh, we do not have, we don't want to take a long time, but um, uh, if you have a question, make it a question that we hope so that there can be engagement. I will um, uh, give you the time, most, at most, 15 minutes, then we'll be done and, uh, uh, for, for this afternoon. So, uh, the microphone is there, it's live, so um, you can make your way there and say something. So, you, you stay here. You <laughs> okay. You are the boss. Just get up and walk to the microphone if you, you, you want to go. If not, that's okay too. Thank you for the time and what a beautiful uh, lecture that we had this afternoon. And I have a question. One of the arguments that the, uh, the white community presents against the immigrants is the fact that they break the law. Mm. How do we reconcile the law of the land with the gospel mm. and still mm. receive the immigrants in this country? And how do we not apply the law, apply the law to, to, to the ones that they come into the nation uh, without documents? That's a very important question. Very. I don't know if I can answer uh, um, completely. Um, first of all, the Bible stress relationship over rules. God is a God of relationship. He has given his revelation, his, the Bible, to connect with us, to live in relationship with us. Obviously, rules follow. I think in our culture, we reverse that. I think in our culture, we, 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 we believe that rules are rules, and rules should not be broken, and everybody has to fulfill the rules 100%. Even though sometimes those who do follow that argument is still at some point in their lives have broken the law. I think crossing the border is, is not a criminal act. These people really are coming, many of them, for survival. I think, I think Justo Gonzalez helped us to read the Bible from, from, from as, as strangers, as aliens, and stories like Abraham. He had to go with his wife to Egypt because there was a famine in Israel. I mean, he's the father of our faith. Why he told his wife, Sarah, I know you are beautiful. And these people, they find that you are my wife, they're going to kill me. He told his wife, tell, tell them that you are my sister. because he was in the border looking for survival, not only for his family, but also for people that depend on him. A lot of these people come from Latin America, cross the border, because in many instances, we, the United States of America, have to take the, the, the responsibility for a lot of the things that happen in Latin America. Now, I think when we talk about laws and many Christians quote us Romans 13, 
that we must submit to the authorities. But they forgot to read Romans 12. When Paul encourages us to love one another, even to love our enemies. This is not about an issue of being Democrat or Republican, because both parties recognize that this immigration law is broken. How can even try to submit to a broken law? I'm not trying to say that we must, we must, this, we should not, you know, obey the laws in the country, you know, you should drive 55, you should not 75. I'm not, you know, I'm advocating that. We're talking about here, you know, uh, people that are leaving their homelands due to violence, due to a lot of victimization, oppression, hunger. I'm sure as a, as, a, as a father, as a mother, I think all of us as parents, we, we can do whatever it takes to put bread on the table for our children. So I think we should read Romans 13, but we should not forget Romans 12. Okay, uh, that's not going to be settled right now. Next question. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing with us the, the images of Christ from a, a Latino uh, diaspora perspective that help draw our attention to the humanity of Christ. My question is, how, how do we um, connect with the humanity of Christ while not also losing the divinity of Christ? Mm. If I want to live, live my theology, and, mm. and that's an important aspect that's coming to mind, and engage theology, but how, how do we also hold on to the divinity, that, that part of Christ that gives us the Holy Spirit that empowers us to live mm -hmm. as aliens in this world? How do we keep those two in tension or, or not overemphasize one as we have overemphasized another at, at times? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a good question. Um, I said that the, the, uh, the missionaries uh, The Christ that they took to Latin America, obviously they emphasize the divinity of Christ, the, the glorified Christ. But I, I, my, my, I'm, I'm proposing that we, we, cannot, we cannot leave the divinity of Christ. Christ is divine. He's one of the, with the Father. The same nature, the same essence. We cannot divide that. We, can, we cannot overlook that. But my point here in this, in this lecture was to rediscover something that the missionaries uh, that went to our lands really tried to overemphasize the divinity and sacrifice the humanity of Jesus Christ. But both are important. Both are needed. Otherwise, I mean, we will be, I mean, if, if Jesus is not God, then, then you know, we, are, we, have a, we have a wrong theology. You know, we, we have to abide by the creeds. I think the Nicene Creed and the Chalcedonian Creed talks about, you know, that Jesus and, and God are the same. But Rene Padilla was saying, yes, they are, those are true. But they fail to talk about that Jesus is, is the one who walks with the people who are in need, who the, who the people who are suffering in that context, there's so much oppression and so much poverty. One more question. You may have just answered this question, but I was wondering about Rene Padilla's critique of conciliar Christology. Is he saying it's insufficient? We need to say more about who Christ is, or is it misleading in some way? Uh, can you elaborate your question a little bit? Yeah, so is it just not enough? We need to say more about Christ. We need to say how he lived his life. We need to talk about his, the historical Jesus and his acts and his love for his neighbor. Or is it, does it really take us in a wrong direction? when we go to Chalcedon, uh, is it misleading us in some more serious way rather than merely being insufficient? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, Dr. Quayle. Yeah, you, you are a theologian. No, no, I'm not, you are a theologian. So I, I'm, I'm doing the uh, brokering here. The question is, 
uh, in Padilla's uh, criticism of uh, conciliar Christology, mm -hmm. as in Chalcedon mm -hmm. and Nicaea, is Padilla saying that uh, th that Christology, those Christological formulations are insufficient, mm -hmm. or is right, he right. saying yes, that yes, yes. they are wrong? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I mean, it, to yeah, put yeah. in the vernacular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> or, Very good. Okay, good. Or at least yeah. they kind of, they might, yeah. okay, they might be technically correct, but they orient us in a wrong way. Or they they point, well, put us in a wrong direction. Just, just, just leave it as wrong so that you feel like it's, <laughs> it's, Because otherwise, if you keep uh, defining more, it, it's complicated. Just leave it as wrong. Yeah. Okay, yeah, good. Th th thanks for clarification. Good, good. yeah. Um, no, I don't think this necessarily says they are wrong, but I think they're, they're saying that there is incomplete. They were presenting, yes, these wonderful categories, propositional truths that Jesus is God and is indivisible with God, but, but at the same time, they were, they, were, they were leaving aside this important aspect. I think, I think this reveals, you know, you know we, we, we don't leave completely our culture behind when we present the gospel. We are shaped by, by, by where we were born. I think, you know, our missionaries did a good job. I mean, doing evangelism and church and planting and uh, creating all these wonderful institutions in Latin America. But this individualistic Christianity, this, this uh, uh, just concern for my relationship with God and not concern what's going on in my community, that's something I think what Padilla was concerned. Yeah. Thank you. I hope it does. Okay. Can somebody help me with the microphone, please?